see each and every one of you here this morning, if you're here in person, if you are participating online, it's great uh, that you are watching and uh, being part of a Covenant in this way. I'm Jeremy Griffin, and I'm the Director of Outreach here at Covenant, and again, it's great to be with you all. I hope that many of you had a great and a happy Halloween last night and got boatloads of candy. Uh, the problem is with Halloween, I'm not sure why we had it yesterday, because for the last seven to eight months, all of us have been wearing masks and eating a whole lot of junk food, and so I don't understand why we even really had it at all, uh, but uh, it was a fun uh, evening. Now, I wonder if any of you here or any of you watching online, have you ever been fearful? Have you ever had a great fear or faced a fear? Oh, well, one time when I was uh, living in uh, Jamaica, I uh, was there about uh, uh, six years ago, and I was traveling all around uh, the country uh, doing research on short-term mission trips, and I interviewed all these hosts to figure out what their thoughts were about American teams coming uh, from the U.S. to Jamaica. And one fear uh, that I had was I was so fearful that I was going to be robbed or that I was going to be stabbed or that I was going to be mugged. And uh, Jamaica uh, previously uh, was the murder capital of the world. Uh, and so that uh, in, in, uh, just like in light, I just put up my fear so much. But then we realized that many of these uh, uh, murders or whatnot are committed against uh, another Jamaican, and they're never, ever, ever against a tourist or someone from uh, North America or from Europe. But I just thought, I was determined in my mind that I was going to get, uh, I was going to get mugged. And one day I was with one of my hosts, Olivine, and she was taking me to an interview. I had the interview with the person, talked to them for a couple hours. I was walking down the street, and this day I thought, this is it. This is the day. It's going to happen. Uh, I, I remember walking down the street beside her, and I saw this man come from behind her car. I'm like, that's him. He's got a gun. He's got a knife. I grab my wallet. I step over like this and nothing. And he just walks by. And I almost said to Olivine, can I hold your hand? I'm like terrified here. I was so scared. And it was really all this fear was up here. It was irrational. I had no problem with security while I was there. Uh, but that was a fear that I had that felt so, so real. Well, the question for us today is, what do you do when you are fearful? What fears do you face? I mean, many of us, we know that we're in a global pandemic. Uh, we would say that our fears or that our, our, our anxiety is heightened. I don't know if you're like me, that you've maybe gone to a grocery store and you take a, a box of Cheerios or coffee or milk and you wonder, did someone else are, who is uh, positive, did they touch this? <laughs> and then am I going to get sick? And then am my family going to get sick? And then we're all going to die all because I touched the multigrain box of Cheerios, or you go and you're like, that person's not wearing a mask. Did he forget about his mask? Is it a political statement? Did he sneeze in his mask? I'm going to get it. I mean, oh my gosh, we have this irrational ideas or these fears. And for all of us, uh, we know uh, the election is coming up, and you're fearful uh, that if the person that you voted for isn't going to get elected, you believe it is the, you believe it is the end of the world. Well, I have a solution for you. You can move to Canada, uh, the great white land of the north where I used to live, and surrender your U.S. citizenship, and you can move uh, there. But some of us do have those fears. Maybe you're fearful uh, about just uh, seeing your family members at Thanksgiving and uh, being around a table. Oh, gosh, 24 hours with them. What are you going to do? You know, maybe you're uh, fearful about the remote learning. You're, you have ang true anxiety about the Chromebooks and about trying to submit uh, all this uh, stuff to your teacher, and it's just not going the way that you expected. Many of us have, I believe, uh, a heightened sense of fear in this world today. So what do we do when we are fearful? Well, we have been in this series looking at Gideon, and for those of you who are not familiar uh, with Gideon or not familiar with uh, the Bible, he is an Old Testament uh, person, a character in the book of Judges. And we are in this series called Gideon, a Reluctant Leader. 
And a judge is someone who rules a nation or guides the nation. They're not a king. Uh, and they help a nation when the nation is uh, just overrun with, a, a, uh, with another a nation that's uh, ruling them and controlling them. And we've found out a lot about Gideon so far. And the life of Gideon really answers this question about what to do with fear. Uh, we met Gideon uh, when he was in a wine press and he was threshing wheat. And for those of you who know anything about uh, threshing wheat, uh, is a wine press is down underground. And when you thresh wheat, you're supposed to throw it up in the air, and then the chaff blows away, and then the wheat comes down. I don't know how you can do that uh, underground when there's no air circulating. You just can't do it. And then God appears to him you know, and says, you are a mighty warrior. And he's like, no, nope. <laughs> you got the wrong guy. I'm from a weak tribe of Manasseh. I am the weakest of my family. No. But he does answer this call. And he does become a judge for the nation of Israel, even though he has so much fear. And then last week, we found out that he was about to go to war uh, with the Midianites and the Amalekites, but specifically the Midianites. And they had a huge army of 135,000 people. And Gideon, at the beginning, uh, had 32,000 people. And then uh, the troops are reduced uh, to 9,700 troops. And then finally, Gideon only has 300 troops to fight against 135,000 people. For you Vegas uh, bookies out there, it's only uh, 450 to 1 odds. The chances of them to win this are not a zilch in human terms. It's not going to happen. And why did some of these men leave uh, Gideon? Well, they had a legitimate reason. They were fearful. In Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 8, it says, Then the officer shall add, it's talking about an army here, Is anyone afraid or fainthearted? Let him go home so that his fellow soldiers will not become disheartened too. So they had this rule in Israelite law that if you were fearful, you were allowed to to leave. And so that's why some of, some of them left, and they didn't want to incite fear into the military. So Gideon, he's got some fearful men that leave him, and he is fearful too, and he basically thinks, oh my goodness, what is going to happen? He probably thinks he's going to die, and this is ridiculous to go to war with 300 people against 135,000. Well, why is Gideon a reluctant leader? Well, you're going to find out here in Judges chapter 7, uh, verses 9 through 12, which you'll read. Uh, During that night, the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. This is key in verse 10. If you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. And listen to what they're saying. Afterward, you'll be encouraged to attack uh, the camp. So he and uh, his, Pura, his servant, went down in the outposts of the camp. The Midianites and Amalekites and all the other eastern peoples had settled in the valley thick as locusts. Their camels could, be, could no more be counted than the sands on the seashore. So it says there very explicitly in verse 10 that Gideon is afraid. He is fearful. That Hebrew word, uh, fearful or afraid, is there multiple times uh, in uh, the story of Gideon, and it's one of the keys to unlocking what's going on in Gideon's uh, life. Uh, He has all these warriors that have left him. I think we would be fearful as well. So Gideon, what does he do when he is fearful? The first thing that he does is he faces the fear of the insurmountable odds against you. Or that's what he does. Face the fear of the insurmountable odds against you. Gideon admitted he was afraid. God says, are you afraid? Gideon says, yes. (laughs) I think I'm going to die. I need help. I need help. Give me more help. So he he, he admitted it. It was not a problem to him at all to admit that. So for us, what are we uh, fearful of? Are we fearful about our future? 
Are we fearful, perhaps, about the security of our job or a job evaluation coming at the end of the year? Maybe you're fearful about that next date that may happen, or maybe it's not going to happen. You know, maybe you're fearful about public speaking, a presentation where your boss says, hey, you got to present for 15 minutes, and you are like, oh gosh, I can't do this, I can't do this. Or maybe you're fearful about the bills that are due at the end of the month. You have to face your fears if you want to overcome them. And we continue on with the story in verses 13 through 15 as we see them uh, get some confirmation from the Lord from Gideon, or to, give, to Gideon. It says this, Gideon arrived just as a man was telling a friend his dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp. It struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. His friend responded, this can be nothing other than the sword of, the, of Gideon, son of Joash, the Israelite. God has given the Midianites and the whole camp into his hands. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshiped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called up, get up, the Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. And so we see God give a sign to Gideon. He gives uh, someone a dream, and this dream is about a big loaf of barley bread uh, that tumbles into the camp and, uh, and uh, it uh, destroys a tent. And so it's easy to interpret for them uh, because in Israelite times, really impoverished people would eat barley. They ate barley bread. And because the Midianites were ruling over them and controlling them, that's what they ate. So the barley bread easily represents uh, the people of Israel and these 300 men. And then the tent that's collapsed are the Midianites and the Amalekites as well. So what does Gideon uh, do here uh, with his fear? Well, the second thing that we learn is that he eventually comes to a place where he trusts God with your fear. You trust God with your fear. That's what Gideon does. He looks for a sign. He gets a sign. Uh, he uh, acknowledges that he's uh, fearful and that he's able to trust God. And we find out that he worships God uh, later on. And that's what Gideon does. You see, God, through this dream, is removing the fear that's in Gideon's heart. You never see God mad at Gideon or criticizing him for his lack of faith. God graciously gives Gideon sign after sign after sign after sign, and we never see God saying, you shouldn't ask for a sign, you shouldn't do that. We see that God acquiesces and bends and bows uh, to Gideon's requests because of his fearful heart. In the book of Judges, when you see all the different judges or all the different rulers, uh, Gideon is the middle one. All the ones before Gideon are, are, are described in, in mostly positive, uh, great ways, and all the ones after him, they just tank. They just get worse. Uh, Jephthah and Samson, uh, they're not as great a leaders. And Gideon is this man who's 50-50. He's fearful, but he has faith, but he trusts, but he has faith. He's weak, but he has faith. I mean, he just goes back and forth and back and forth, and it just seems like this Gideon can never really uh, get his relationship with God. God together, his leadership together. He is really this reluctant man that just doesn't really have it figured out. Well, I mean, for many of us, God has revealed, uh, 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 revealed himself to us in many different ways, and we should be able to trust him. And we've, if we've never trusted God with our lives, what's holding us back? Maybe it's something that's been done to us, or maybe it's something that's been done uh, to you. Uh, but if we are fearful, it shows that we have an incomplete relationship with God. You know, in uh, the New Testament, in 1 John 4, 18, it says, There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. And the opposite of fear is not courage. It's not faith. The opposite, according to 1 John, of, fi of fear is love. 
And because when you love, and when you love God, and when you love others, there's this open, gracious, uh, wonderful, kind relationship, and there's this uh, degree of mutuality that you have with God, where you can fully, openly love Him. But fear uh, shows uh, that there's not a full, uh, a full relationship of love. And so when we want fear to be removed, we have to say we've got to move from a fear-based relationship to a loving-based uh, relationship. And now we see uh, the, uh, the next uh, passage of Scripture that we're going to look at is the battle takes place in verses 16 through uh, 21. And it says this, uh, "...dividing the 300 men into three companies..." He placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me uh, blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp, at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands the trumpets. They were to blow, uh, they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. This seems pretty uh, ridiculous. Uh, Gideon, he tells these 300 soldiers, go to war with a light, <laughs> uh, with a pot, a clay pot, and a ram's horn. You're like, how in the world are you going to beat 135,000 people with that? You probably don't even have a sword You've got clay pitchers and torches. This seems ridiculous. Why in the world would they go to war like this? Why would they do it at night? What is Gideon doing? What is he thinking? Well, Gideon uh, is actually pretty smart. Some of the commentators uh, say that he's kind of a trickster. He's deceptive. And what he does is when um, people would go to war back then at night, uh, one man would hold a trumpet, and another one would hold a torch. And if uh, you held a torch or a trumpet, you were leading the battalion. And so if there's one lighter trumpet, there's probably a hundred or a couple hundred people behind that one light or trumpet. And so it looks like when there's 300 lights and 300 trumpets, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the hills about to descend, even though they may not even have a sword. And the Midianites are attacked in the middle of the night in the changing of the guard, and they are confused, and then they start to attack each other. This just seems absolutely uh, ridiculous. And we see the end of this uh, war, of the story, in verses 22 through the end of the chapter, how it finishes up, where it says, When the three hundred trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men through the camp to turn on each other and their swords. The army fled to Beth Shittah towards Zerah, as far as the border of Abel Meholah near Tabitha. Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh were called out. And they pursued the Midianites. Gideon sent messengers throughout the hill country of Ephraim, or Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out as they took the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. And so they are victorious in battle. It seems like a fairy tale. It seems like a myth. It seems like fiction uh, that they could win this battle of uh, just, it just seems ridiculous that they could actually win with torches and with horns. 
but it's not so far-fetched as it seems. And we learn this last thing, I think, from this passage about facing our fears is we know that God can be glorified in spite of your fear. We know that God can be glorified in spite of your fear. You see, God, He gets all the praise for this victory. Gideon doesn't and the men don't, but all the praise goes to God because it can only be God bringing about this victory. There's no other way to explain it, no other way to make sense of it at all. I think uh, the Apostle Paul alludes to this war uh, with Gideon in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, where he says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. The jars of clay and this power is from God. And for us, in our day, the treasure is the gospel. The jars of clay are us. And we have this immeasurable power that comes from God to be able to face the fears that we have. And God is able to bring the victory over whatever uh, thing it is that you are facing. I mean, on a serious note, many of us, we may be just having so much fear and not able to trust God. Maybe you're fearful about being alone uh, for the rest of your life or for many years. Maybe you're fearful about a physical problem that just won't go away. Maybe you're fearful about the cuts that are coming at your company uh, at the end of the year and you don't know what to do. Maybe you're fearful about your future and it's not working out the way that you hoped. Or maybe you're fearful about that relationship that's not getting better and you thought that it would. Many of us face these fears. I mean, around the world, many people in other countries, they face fears as well. Uh, They face a different type of fear that we face, and it's persecution. I want to share a story with you that fits this so well. In Ethiopia, uh, one of our ministry partners, they've seen unprecedented growth in this year during COVID. In the last month, uh, they've seen 300 Muslims come to faith and be saved and baptized in a matter of like 21 to 30 days. It's phenomenal. But many of them, when they turn to Jesus, a legitimate fear that they have is persecution and violence and torture that can happen to them. And one story was that there's this well, young, uh, this man, he's not young, he's uh, a little bit uh, older, and uh, he came to know Jesus Christ, and he followed after him, and he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus, and all the Muslim imams, a Muslim imam is a leader of a mosque, they all said, you need to stop, stop proclaiming about Jesus, stop telling people about this religion, so, and they, and he would not, and so ten imams got together one day. They captured him, they tortured him, they killed him, they threw his body in the woods, Uh, they buried him with leaves, they buried him with sticks, and they went back to their respective uh, areas that they lived, and they proclaimed all over the mosques and all over the loudspeakers, he is dead, he is dead, this menace is no longer with us. And for 24 hours, his body lay in the woods, and after 24 hours, this man revived, and he woke up, and he brushed the leaves, and he brushed the dirt off of himself. He checked himself in a hospital, and uh, he got better after about uh, a month or six weeks there, and he went back to uh, the leaders and said, Jesus is king. He has brought me back from the dead. And he said, when I was dead, I had this vision of on this right side, there was these goats, and they were ugly, and they were grotesque, and they were burning. And if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to be part of the goats. He said there was also sheep, and they were beautiful, and they were white, and they were holy. And there was this holy man, this white man in front, in in a loving relationship with these sheep. Won't you follow after him? And six of the imams who killed him said, okay, I'm done with Islam. I follow Jesus. I want him as my Savior. And we killed you, and we can't explain it, so I'm following after your, uh, your God, Jesus Christ. 
And when I was in Ethiopia, I met this man. And in Ethiopia, you have a, uh, yeah, he, he stood right beside me. In Ethiopian culture, men hold hands with uh, men. Uh, they may grab uh, their side and hold them very tight or put their arm around each other. That's uh, just kind of the male relationship that they have. And he t- held me tight, very awkwardly, <laughs> right beside him, and put his hand on my side. And I thought, here I am, standing beside this man who was dead, who had come back to life, But the greater thing is that we both know this man, Jesus Christ, who was dead, who came back to life. He faced the fear of death, and he went forward, and he trusted God with his fear. When we place our fear uh, alongside or compare it with the fear that this man had, it just seems not as big. (laughs) That Cheerios box that may or may not have COVID on it, it just doesn't seem... (laughs) We can joke about it. It just doesn't seem as uh, serious when we face it against those fears. So I end with the question that we started off with is, what are you going to do with your fears? Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for how wonderful and good you are. Uh, We thank you that you overcome our fears. You overcome death. You overcome sin and the grave. We thank you for this life of Gideon, and even though he is imperfect in many ways, just like me and just like all of us, Lord, he vacillates in his faith, and he just doesn't get it uh, sometimes, just like us, Lord. uh, Help us uh, to fully trust you no matter what we face, uh, Lord. And we pray this in your Son's name, amen. Well, at this time, we may turn our hearts and minds towards uh, communion.